Chris and Chris Talk Movies. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. My name is Chris Ferry and of course this is my co-host. My name is Chris Huddleston. And today we are both tickled pink to be talking to you about the 1989 humdinger doozly do Roadhouse. Do you have a synopsis, Chris? I do. And this is uh, this is the IMDb synopsis, and it is to the point. A tough bouncer is hired to tame a dirty bar. <laughs> uh, and th- this one stars Patrick Swayze, Kelly Lynch, Sam Elliott, Ben Gazzara, um, some other people. Uh, and it was directed by the great director, Rowdy Harrington. Um, which... I don't know what else Rowdy did, but I guess I can look. But is is uh, so this was a first time watch for me. So is it OK if I go first on this one? It's my delight. So <clears throat> this is one that I'd always stayed away from because honestly, even as a kid, I thought it looked really lame. Uh, and, you know, this is one over the years that people have said, you know, oh, I bet you like Roadhouse. And, you know, I would say I've never seen it before. And people would say you've never seen Roadhouse, you know. Yeah, it's just like one of those, you know, uh, it's kind of viewed as a classic. So it is, um, you know, it's very, it's very 80s. Uh, and, but not in a, not really in a bad way. I mean, it's, uh, um, I don't know. There was a lot about this that I, I, let's just say I was highly entertained by this, right? And, it starts out in the very beginning. I laughed a bunch because Patrick Swayze is working at this bar. I don't know where it's supposed to be, but it's this real kind of swanky bar. And uh, so he breaks up this fight. Uh, this guy, like, I don't know, like a woman tries to stab a guy and then a guy kicks the woman or something. So, you know, there's this fight or whatever. And uh, so he breaks it up excuse me and uh you know they're gonna he's gonna kick the guy out of the bar and the guy says Dalton I've always wanted to get a shot at you or whatever and I just thought what a funny concept that I mean I guess maybe this happens I don't know but that there would be like a bar patron that would know the bouncer well enough that like he wants to fight him you know so I mean there's too much to talk about in this movie. Uh, but some of my favorite things about it is like, I don't know. I've never been to a roadhouse like this. So you're right. At first he starts, he's working in like a fancy place that you're sort of like, is that a road? Free, you know, uh, because it's upscale, uh, nice Nice dress clientele, good band. There's a live band, right? It's a nightclub is what it feels like. And I'm like, is is that a roadhouse? Because he's Dalton is like the best in the business, right? <laughs> like of the business of turning around dangerous roadhouses. <laughs> is this the thing? But everybody knows his name. They're yeah. Like, he's known oh, like man, is that Dalton? Like <laughs> he's Madonna. He's, he's got one name. Right. Uh, and and it, oh, he's not the best. The best is what's the other guy's name is like, well, if I want the best in the business. They're like, oh, that would be Sam Wal- Elliott. And it uh, turns out to be Sam Elliott. Right. His name is Wade. So, Wade. So, yeah. Wade. And he goes by one name, too. That would be Wade. And he goes like, well, Wade's getting old. You know, I need you. You're the man for the job. We'll come back to we'll come back yeah. to that. About him yes. So but th- this is a world in which. It's almost like saying, like, look, we're opening our new uh, place in Vegas and I need you. I need Danger Mouse. I need the best of the best. I'm like, oh, well, that's Skrillex. No, 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 no. Skrillex is yesterday. I need you. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like I, roadhouse bouncer fixers. They call them a cooler. I mean, maybe I just don't know what I'm talking about, but it felt really weird. Yeah, the I patrons, like that. Patrons of the bar would be like, is that Dalton? <laughs> Like, I, you know, I've not, not spent it's not like I've never gone to bars in my life, but I haven't spent tons of times in my in bars. I've never known the name of a bouncer. 
you know, right. uh, I mean, I guess I'm not, you know, not spending mm-hmm. enough time in, in bars, but yeah. So the guy comes, so a guy comes, so after this fight, a guy comes in and that actor's name, uh, I, I, I'm not sure the pronunciation is Kevin. It's T I G H E is his last name. T G T. I'm not sure. I would have said Teague, but I don't know. Teague. But it's it's interesting because this guy was a character actor who almost always played villains. So when he walks in, I thought, oh, this guy, he's going to be a bad guy, right? Well, he's CIA or he's Mm -hmm. the head of the drug, you know, the local drug. Yeah, because that's the kind of roles that this guy always played. Well, it turns out he's just a guy that owns the roadhouse and wants to hire Dalton. And I I, throughout the film, I kept thinking maybe there was going to be a turn that he was going to double cross it. But it's not. He's a good guy throughout the and he's Throughout thrilled with Dalton's perfect. Dalton turns it around and he's delighted. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he's, he supports Dalton. He's always got his back. You know, he just can't do it himself. He's got to have Dalton to do it for him. And, and Dalton delivers. But he comes in and he says, I want to hire you because you're the best. Cause he's known nationwide or whatever. And he's like, I'm not the best, you know, Wade is the best, but okay. You're second best. And he says, uh, 5,000 up front, 500 at a night. I know. And I looked up. Is that I what did, the best gets in uh, 1989? Because that doesn't I, sound lucrative. I did the, like, went on inflation calculator. And he's there all the time. But if, if he was just working on the weekends, in today's money, it would be like $10,000 a month. Uh, if he was working five nights a week, it's like, Twenty five thousand dollars a month. Oh, it is. It maybe yeah. maybe it was really good money then at that time. Yeah, maybe it was. Like you're, you're making a lot of money at that roadhouse then. Yeah, I don't know, but so I like I did the math on how much he gets paid, and so then he goes. You know, we immediately go to this other town where um, the you know where the roadhouse is. The double. What's it called? The double deuce. Yeah, and he goes and gets a this just old beater car and then he moves into and it actually turns out to be like kind of a cool place but he moves it he rents a room above a barn and it's a hundred dollars a month and it's like this guy's making 10 to twenty five thousand dollars a month and he's renting a hundred dollar a month place and and everybody in this world everybody in this world i want to say either gets it or they don't get it right and all the patrons they don't get it. You know what I mean? But people on the end, some of the bouncers, oh, they get it. Some of the owners, they get it. Some of the people in the band, they get it. The guy who owns this farm and rents them, he gets it, right? And Dalton can tell right off the bat if they get it or they don't get it. Mm-hmm. And I, it just feels like this. there's a world of you either get it or you don't. And <laughs> frequently, if you go to a roadhouse, you're carrying a very large knife. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I lost count. You could, there's a drinking game you could play where every time someone pulls a knife, drink. Like big crocodile Dundee knives, not switchblades. Rambo knives, yeah. yeah like, Sometimes they're switchblades. Come on, come on. And they're like, you know, and that's why I said last, when I was setting this up last time, I'm like, get your cocaine out. Because this whole movie, like everyone's eyes are very like, you want to go? You want to go? And I was like... I don't know what's going to happen right now. <laughs> like everybody did a bump right before we started shooting this scene. And now the, uh, the, the, the band. <clears throat> so they have the thing where. Um, the band's great. Yeah. It's like chicken wire house band. And that's, and that. They're great. I've never, I've never witnessed that before, but that's a real thing. Uh, sure. Where they have the chicken. Cause uh they do that in the Blues Brothers, where they're playing it like uh, the Blues Brothers are playing it at like a country bar, and they have the that thing. Feels, and the, that feels like a roadhouse. So I'm thinking, yeah, Dan Aykroyd, maybe about Roadhouse like being refers a real thing, to the you know? Double Deuce. Maybe you know, not necessarily. He only works at roadhouses. He works at nightclubs and bars or whatever. But this right. place where he ends up is a true like side of the road Texas style like roadhouse with the chicken wire and the rowdy folks and throwing yeah and stuff yeah. So, but the, you know, the guy brings him in and it's like the first night and it's just Dalton there. So Patrick Swayze is Dalton and it's just him observing. And it's not just like a fight. It's like a riot happens in this bar. 
I mean, there's like 30, 40 people fighting at one time. And I'm thinking you wouldn't have just bouncers for this. You would be calling in the police. to, And it's just like this is just a regular Saturday night. And it's like it's like in an old Western, the band is still playing. So yeah. big wide shot, throwing stuff, throwing the- punches and bottles and people picking each up the crashing tables. And me, I was like, <laughs> the fight's happening. A beer bottle, he ducks a beer bottle, almost hits him in the head and he just dodges it casually and finishes his drink. You know, I mean, <laughs> this movie is so entertaining. It's baloney. And then, of course, we meet Wade and it's. It's uh, Sam Elliott. He's like, oh, there you are. I never thought I'd see you back in the game or whatever he says. And you're just like, oh, this is the famous Wade that he thinks is better. And the two of them get into shenanigans and they've gotten each other's back. And so Patrick Swayze has a Ph.D. in what? Philosophy? Yeah. Your audio dropped out. Oh, I muted it for a second because I keep coughing. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Apologies. I am getting over COVID. So it finally finally caught me yeah i are you you're feeling better i feel great i i walked like five or six miles today and yesterday so i physically feel fine i just i and i've talked to a couple of people who said um you know i didn't lose my sense of taste or smell or any of that kind of stuff i was just exhausted for two or like this two or three days i just could barely get out of bed basically um otherwise it was just a cold and I'm, I'm sure I'm boring people that, you know, as millions and millions and millions of people have had COVID. But uh, I've talked to a lot of people who said they just had this lingering cough for weeks, which I'm hoping that's not the the case. But but otherwise, I I feel really good. But well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're feeling better. Well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I don't know what we were saying, but one thing makes it itself uh, like I thought makes sense is it's like oh he gets this crappy car because they immediately like smash a hole in his windshield and stab you know stab his tires and everything so it's like oh okay this is why he buys an old beater car because but the funny one of the funny really funny things about this and i guess i why i always resisted this movie is even even as a kid in the 80s when these action movies were so popular the the kind of macho you know they don't talk and all that kind of stuff a lot of those movies i wasn't into and and i somewhat was somewhat hypocritical about that because i liked stallone and i liked arnold and but a lot of the stuff didn't appeal to me and he's not really like that he is maybe the nicest (laughs) badass guy i've ever seen in a movie because it's really funny there's multiple times where he comes out and they've like shoved a stop sign through his car and stuff. And it's just, and he just shakes his head and laughs. It's like, those crazy kids smashing out my windshield, you know? And so I'm making and, 500 a night. Yeah. And I guess he doesn't care. He's making 500 a night, but until the end. And um, I guess we should say, you know, we always spoil these movies, but until the end, when things really go sideways and he starts killing people, he's just the nicest most happy-go-lucky guy that could just kill you that you've ever seen, you know, and I really like that. And also I wanted to say, and this, you know, this is a a recurring theme with these movies that we watch from the eighties. Sam Elliott in 1989 was 45 years old. (laughs) I, I, I mean, not that he looks bad, but he, I mean, he looks older than 45 in this. I, he looks like 55. Um, but, you know, he's got the that just long hair and, you know, he's Sam Elliott. I mean, he's he's Sam Elliott being Sam Elliott in this. But uh, but I was just like, oh, my God, I can't believe he's 45 years old in this movie. So I want to talk about the bad guy in this movie because I realized I had the thought about three quarters of the way through when things start to get more serious. The bad guy, um, Ben Gazzara is the yeah, actor and, and uh, he was a heavy, a lot great performance because he's so he plays it so light and charming. Um, and he's such an unlikely 
roadhouse bad guy you know he doesn't have the 10 gallon hat you know you think it's something boss hog in this setting but he's not that at all he's more rat pack than yeah uh you know uh shit kicker but but he he's an absolute sociopath <laughs> like he does not balk at at escalating at ultimately committing murder brazenly like there's no doubt as to who is doing this stuff but he has no fear of the law and he has no fear of uh he's just trying to get this dalton character out of his way but and let me say this real quick very early on i think dalton's first sort of interaction with him he so he lives across this like pond or something from the the farm where he's renting in this you know in this big mansion and there's one part where dalton is driving down the road but he hasn't actually met the guy yet and dalton is driving down the road and the the bad guy is in his mustang and at first i thought oh the guy it's the middle of the day and the guy's just drunk no he's just swerving back and forth across and it's just basically like this guy has no regard for anyone other and he just runs dalton off the road yeah. and he not knowing who he is just he's a car coming the other direction but he's just singing he's got the radio on the top down and he's just He's singing a song, you know, he's just swerving big S curve from one side of the road to the other and runs a guy off the road. Yeah, because he just owns everything in this and town. Just keeps doing it, right? Just like everything's his and he controls not a care in the world. And he just expects people to get out of it. It's a great introduction to it. Yeah. Character. Yeah. Um, but I realized I'm like, oh, this isn't like a Dukes of Hazard roadhouse set. movie. This is a Kung Fu movie. And we see Patrick, everybody knows martial arts. <clears throat> Patrick Swayze, you know, with his shirt off doing I, I couldn't tell if it was Kung Fu forms or Tai Chi form. It looked like Tai Chi. Not that I'm an expert on any of it. There was, but it looked there like Tai Chi. a couple of things that were looked reminiscent of Kung Fu. And he certainly he certainly knows how to fight, fight several guys multiple times. One, uh, you know, him against a group of people. Um, but, but it's like he's a Zen Yes. Tough guy. And at the end, as it escalates and the bad guy is killing his loved ones, you know, this basically he works in a tough field, but he's basically a pacifist. Mm -hmm. Right. And and is forced uh, to confront the fact that he's going to have to deal like this guy. Violence is a last resort. And and that this guy is forcing the last resort. Mm -hmm. And and that felt, I mean, that's not unique to Kung Fu movies. That's Westerns and Kung Fu have borrowed from each other a lot. Uh, but but it really started to feel more like a Kung Fu movie set in this roadhouse milieu. Very much so, yeah. Yeah, like calling it roadhouse and setting it in that roadhouse makes you think it's just this one thing. But it really, it, it sort of plays with a lot of different genre type stuff um you know ben gazara is not a roadhouse bad guy he's not he's not a kung fu bad guy really either but um he's one of my favorite parts of the film um i don't know man there's just there, there's an intangible 1989 thing too that's the hair so he's he he, he gets cut by one of these people who have a knife one of the many many people who attack him with a knife and he's getting stitched up at the local hospital. There's a pretty doctor that, of course, becomes his love interest that I think ends up being Ben Gazzara's daughter or old flame. I could I don't remember. She I don't know that they were ever actually involved, but he was obsessed with her. And there was one they say something about at one point she left the town and he I, th I guess like to get away from him. And he like went crazy. I don't know why she came back exactly, but. But yeah, but he was, I don't think they were ever involved. He just, you know, wanted her essentially. And it was kind of like, oh, yeah, he can have everything, but he couldn't have her. But there's so many great classic, you know, 80s movies tropes at play here. Late 80s. Like, so in the hospital, she has her long blonde hair pulled back and she has big glasses, right? She's the doctor. She's professional. And then he asks her out on a date and she shows up. And she's got her hair down. She's in a skin tight mini dress and her hair has they've done that thing where the bangs go up and the wings go out mm -hmm. <laughs> on the sides. Kelly Lynch is the is the yeah. actress. I mean, yeah. she's great. She's mm -hmm. beautiful and looks the part and, and her acting is great. Um, 
the hair in this movie is fantastic. His hair is is this sort of glorious late 80s mullet. You know, it's shoulder length, the party in the back and all feathered up and teased out. And everybody's hair is great. And the high waisted pants and not full shoulder pads, but like blousy tops on everybody. Uh, there's a sort of a like just a attitude and a tone that was so nostalgic for me. And it's like, what did you say? The guy says, like, hey, Dalton, I've always wanted a piece of you. Like the guy comes mm-hmm. in the bar with his knife, sees a guy and it's like a gunslinger movie. It's like, oh, I'm going to be the guy that shot Liberty Valance, you know? <laughs> but in the eighties, it was like, like, who do you think? What, what is happening here? The other thing is, so, this this happens many times. He's like, oh, I want you to be polite. I want you to be nice. When somebody is being violent or whatever, I want you to, you know, but be nice. Get them out the door until it's time to not be nice. These are people with knives. Like, mm-hmm. he tried to kill you. Not threatened to kill you or gestured at it. Like, had the knife. You guys had a fight in which he attempted to murder you in public, in this bar with a knife, several passes. Like he tried his best to murder you with a knife. You got the better of him. You used your Kung Fu. You bashed his head in the table. It's like, let's get this guy outside. So the, his punishment is to escort him outside. Not, mm-hmm. that, that was attempted murder. <laughs> like it's really assault with a deadly weapon. That, that's yeah. Not any gray area there, but they're just like, he's had enough. Get him out. And, and again and again, their, 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 their crime is attempted murder and the punishment is you're not welcome here for the rest of the night like there's yeah you can come bad. back tomorrow exactly yeah. <laughs> and, and so what they do is they go out and they vandalize his car they slash all his tires and they break all of his windows and they trash his car but but the assumption is just sort of like well he'll sleep it off or something i i find that flabbergasting it happens again and again these people aren't groping a waitress or you know starting a fist fight in a bar or smashing a beer bottle, they are pulling out a knife and trying to kill another patron or one of the staff. And and it's almost like a nightly occurrence <laughs> you know, in this bar. And they're just kind of like, well, it's, you know, that's the roadhouse. <laughs> and it's almost like the depiction that we've seen in some other movies of high schools in the 80s, where it's just like, because <clears throat> it's, it's just like this, the bar owner guy is helpless to stop any of this stuff. And it's like, they can't even, um, it's like, what's the point? And even like the, there's like chips in the walls and like the, the posts around the bar just have stuff carved in them and everything. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah, there's no point in even painting anything because these animals are just going to tear it all up. You know, it it, kind of, it kind of, is almost like high schools, you know, they would show then when it was so just, he like, goes, just like he goes and recruits Dalton at what you have calculated is a you know a king's ransom. Mm-hmm. And Dalton has a zero tolerance policy with his staff. He finds out that the bartender has been who is the son or a nephew of it was a nephew, yeah, their character that comes back around, but uh has been sort of skimming from the till and he's fired on the spot. And there's a bouncer that is you know, making love to one of the regulars in the in the that uh, room. scene cracked me up. That was one of the funniest lines because he the guy's in like the back room, like having sex with this woman. And Dalton goes in and just stands there and watches him for a minute. And then the guy sees him and then they, you know, they like pull their clothes on and everything. And he's like, you're out. And he goes for you know for what and he's like you know explains it or whatever and he's like i was on my break <laughs> as if like on your you know people right. like have sex right. on their break at a so job has a zero tolerance <laughs> policy for the staff right no inappropriate sexual behavior that's hilarious no skimming from the till right mm-hmm. i mean that's theft and that's indecent exposure or whatever in the workplace but again the patrons can attempt murder <laughs> like yeah in earnest and and they're just like you're out of here for tonight mm-hmm. <laughs> you call yeah. the guy, you detain this guy and you call the police and you press charges but no no that's that i guess that would be not nice i don't know it, 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 this movie is bonkers in the best ways i wonder i kept thinking watching this 
I would almost have to think that uh, that there were bars that tried to like follow, you know, it's like, hey, let's do what Dalton did, you know, because it's really funny how it not funny, but it's interesting how it evolves because, you know, he I mean, he has the right idea. It's like you're scaring away all the decent people. It's only these horrible, you know, basically criminals who will come in here. So it it and they don't show there's never a montage of them doing any of this. But you just see as it goes along, the bar becomes nicer and nicer and they paint, you know, and they put a new sign up and everything. And now there's like it's supposed to be this little town, but they now have this like a line of people to get in, you know, yeah. and they're just like normal people going in now, yeah. you know, it's a it's an awfully big place for a little mm. town. Um I mean, it's a huge space. And like mm. the band is great. There's so much of the um, dressing of this movie that I I just love. Like there's mm-hmm. music, there's kind of honky tonk rock music throughout that I think is all awesome. Um, it keeps playing through the fight scenes. Awesome. Everybody. And, I, you know, if you if you just only have time to get a taste of this movie and you've never seen it, watch the first half hour. In 1989, it's like the filter they wanted to put on everything was like, let's make this as sexy as we can. Like the men are tough and they have attitude and everybody's got a one liner for each other. And he pulls a knife. Ah, They have a Mm -hmm. dance fight, you know, and and it's like that's why I say it all feels super coked up to me is there. Everyone was like, come on, man, you you, want to do it tonight? It's not that you tonight tonight you die. The whole thing is that vibe. It's like vibrating on like, yeah, this is what it is to be alive. It's just, it's just a roller coaster ride. And in fact, Mm -hmm. I think it only kind of calms down about halfway through. Once you start, once you get to know the villain and it starts to become about Dalton versus the bad guy. Um, And then it escalates in a more conventional way. And the bad guy actually starts killing people, like you said. That then, then the stakes stop being about the sort of frosting and attitude, and they're more like, "Oh, uh, he's dead! Like that dude killed him! Like that's, oh man, you know what I mean?" And then the tone of the thing changes, and Sam Elliott's in it, and he, he's got Dalton's back, and he just he you know he realizes the stakes, but they have that conversation in their kind of one liner way. And I don't know, I man, you don't. I almost feel like you just can't have a movie like this anymore because you can try and recreate some of the intangibles, but that time is past. Like there was such a growing up in the eighties, going through high school in the eighties in Reagan's America. There was such a, from a top down attitude of like simultaneously every man for himself, that's freedom. Mm Mm-hmm. But if I've got money, then I'm doing it right. You know what I mean? Like I'm rich because I'm crushing it and you're poor because you're a loser. So I can take your girlfriend and everybody just understands that that's the way it is. Like, see you on the slopes, bro. And then, you know, you drive. But the thing about that, I, I kept thinking about this watching the movie is the 80s was this decadent era where it was like, you know, <clears throat> you go to the famous uh, Wall Street line, you know, greed for lack of a better word is good or lack of a better term is good. And it's like the 80s was this era. And I mean, people are always trying to make money, but the 80s was this this ostentatious era where it's just like, you know, we all had like as kids, like the poster of the Lamborghinis and Ferraris and all this kind of stuff. But you have all of that. It's like you got to make as much money as possible. And it's like, just get rich and everything. But the villain in every movie is a rich guy. There's never a <coughs> there's never a villain that it's like this guy is a meth head who lives in a small apartment, but he's just evil. You know, it's right. always the bad guy. Right. There's no, is, or the rich guy is the bad no guy. Unabomber in the eighties, the guy living in the cabin, you know, who, who fell through the cracks of society and decided he was going to get back. No, this is not in the eighties. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's always the rich guy. Another thing about this, that 
really stood out. So I want to, I want to come back to that point here in just a second that you brought up about that. You couldn't, uh, you know, this is of its time and you couldn't do this again. Another thing about this, and I'm sure if I had watched this when I was 16, I would have felt very different about this, but there's a lot of nudity in this, just like gratuitous nudity with what mainly just women being topless, but other than the, and she's not really nude in this, I don't think, but other than the, the doctor, and I think it's, you know, to kind of to cr- create a juxtaposition between her and these other women, but the other women are just real, I don't know what as appropriate term to say, but they're just like floozies, right? You know what I mean? Okay. They're like attractive women, yes. but like, yes, there's a misogyny baked into this film from the very concept, the the good guy and the bad guy are men. The, the, anybody who has any agency in this movie is a man, except for the doctor. The, the The woman is a doctor. And yet when she steps out of that role to come after our good guy hero, she puts on a skin tight micro mini dress and teases her hair up to look like the other token women and be the se- sexual object that she's expected to be. Right. So you're like, yeah. Why are you interested? I mean, sure, she's pretty, but she's a nerd doctor. Oh, she's hot too. Like she can cue the ZZ top lick as she's right. in the door. And you're kind of like, wow. So, I mean, all of that's baked right into the 80s too. Is that the women are just kind of like, well, you know, men and girls stories. Yeah. <laughs> it's got to be at no point. Topic. At no point did I, again, like I say, at 16, I probably would have thought, I would have looked at this a lot differently. But at no point, like all these topless women in this, did I ever think like, oh, this is really sexy or whatever. It's just all kind of like in your I think you're supposed to think this, but there's the sort of girlfriend of the bad guy and she has the big bleached hair and she keeps throwing. Is that her behind me? If you. Yeah. 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 She keeps throwing herself at him you know, and he's like not interested in her at all. And I'm, I'm just kind of, I, you know, I I don't want to be like super derogatory, but I just keep thinking like, this is just gross. You know, you know what I mean? Does that, yeah, she's a weird Salome character and she shows up at one point and she uses her sexuality as a weapon. She gets up on stage and she does a sort of a strip tease. And the dare there is to Dalton is like, get up here and stop me from doing this. Like, I know this is inappropriate, and that you don't want this to be happening in your establishment now that it's fancy, but this is right. my power. And you, you know, what are you going to do? Hit me Kung Fu me. Like, yeah, you're going to have to get up here and physically wrestle me off the stage. And she does strip off and you're right. I mean, it's sexy in a complicated way because I mean, there's more I, I we we're talking about these things in broad strokes, but the movie does seem to have something of an it, it is both doing this thing because it is what is expected of it to sell tickets. And there is a limited kind of self-awareness to it that makes it slightly more complicated than just the paint by numbers. You know, like the movies you and I used to make when we were like nine mm-hmm. and it was like you know i'm a ninja and you're an evil agent and yeah <laughs> you know uh i there you know i don't know I, I think people probably have written theses on movies like this oh yeah i have not read them and i don't have one prepared but there's something there's deeper currents whether they are inadvertent or not like this movie feels so of its time in in entertaining ways that it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderfully entertaining thing to go back and revisit. And part of that is you can talk about like how from certain angles, how offensively reductive it is in this Mm -hmm. way or that way. Um, But it's also not trying to paint like, this is what life is like. It's like, this is baloney. It's a fan. Yeah. It's a fantasy for sure. Now to, to, to get to the question of, can they do this today? We're going to find out because this this is sort of how this uh, this movie came up is I was reading that it was just announced in the last week or so that they are remaking this movie with Jake Gyllenhaal as Dalton. No, um, Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't talk about that. Yep. Is Jake Gyllenhaal he driving it. Was it his idea? 
I don't know. I don't know if he's he a producer on weird, it. He loves to do weird movies. He might make it weird. But it'll never be the original. You know, you just no, can't no. Make that movie today in the same way. I mean, even if you shot it scene for scene, it wouldn't feel like the 1989 version. No. And they're moving it for whatever reason. They're moving it to Key West. So it's going to be there. They talk about this like tropical setting. So I don't know. So, you know, the, it sounds like they're Texas, but Florida. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like they're definitely doing something different with it. But unless you do a which I I'm just guessing they're not going to do this. But unless you do like a uh, uh, like the Ben Stiller, Starsky and Hutch, where it's just straight up a spoof. You know, where they're just playing on all these tropes and everything, I, I assume they will do this as just an action movie and not a spoof but you know just so much has changed from from that era that uh and it's not really like you know even with you you, the only thing really you kind of have is the is the gratuitous topless stuff like throughout this but you don't have any well i i take that back i was gonna say there's no uh there's no homophobia in this, but there's actually the there's, the there's a the, fair there's the uh, uh, oh, we didn't the, talk about her the the kind of quote unquote homely waitress that's sweet on him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, She's like, but what like I was girls? Gonna, what's that? She's like, don't you like girls? Yeah, yeah. There's that the the one that the thing that I was thinking of specifically is the one kind of main henchman of Ben Gazzara, who is, of course, knows Kung Fu. But he, there's one scene in the in the end and, you know, he kills, him, kills either. him. But the guy has a hold of him and he's like, I used to F guys like you in prison. And it's like, <laughs> OK, that's uh, they're probably not going to have that line <laughs> in it now. But anyway, so, I mean, it'll it'll be interesting to see what I think it would, you know, mullets have like sort of come back. So I I think that at the very least they should have have him have a mullet in it. You know, I if it was me, I would want to explore it like I want a Christopher Nolan this like Batman. I want to see like how is this is totally a real life thing. Exact story. And let's see how plausible, like how plausible could we make this plot line in in today's world? So it's DeSantis's governor, like we're mm-hmm. in Florida. I want to let's same script. You're not allowed to you're not allowed to change the storyline. You know, you still got a, you know, bad guy who runs the town and all this stuff. But. But you have to make it feel like this could be actually happening in 2023 or whatever, you know. I don't know. Maybe that would take all the fun of that. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, they're definitely not going to go in that direction. But, but doing I mean, like the Starsky and Hutch, like I don't even remember that. That's how forgettable it was. But didn't they do the 70s hair and everything? Didn't they? Yeah, it was very spoofy. It was not. Why, why, why? why I mean, why do that? We already yeah. got that. You got to do something different with it. You know, if you I think it would be fun to, I think it would be fun. I think if, if I were, if I were making this movie, I would have it be clearly it's today and I wouldn't make it a spoof, but I would have the try to make it like unironically everybody acts the way that people do in this movie. It's just a total fantasy world where just everybody acts like this. You know what I mean? I, th- I think that would be I know what you mean. really don't make it like a joke. You know, it's not a spoof and we're not making fun of the eighties, but it's just, it's almost like a, you know, the, the land where business. what's that? You're the best in the business. Hey, isn't that Dalton? Yeah. I think you just keep all that stuff, you know? I don't think you try to make it ironic or anything like that, you know, um, but, but it's, don't know, you know, I, I, he loves to do weird stuff. You've seen Nightcrawler, I assume, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a part of me that's like, it's sort of excited to see what a Jake Gyllenhaal vehicle version. Of I mean, I think, I think Jake Gyllenhaal is a good, uh, I just really like Jake Gyllenhaal. And I mean, I think he, he's one of these guys that can do just about anything. But I 
he's a guy who can do action without seeming douchey, you know? And I, th I think that's the thing that I really like about, um, uh, uh, Swayze. Patrick Swayze in this yeah. is he's doing the tough guy action guy without being a douche, right. you know, the, the uh, entire movie is douchey, but having Patrick Swayze at the center of it somehow saves it from the douchery. Right. Yeah. And you the put fabric. This film is made out of is douchey, but him at the center of it, like, so Patrick Swayze is just such a sweet, likable guy that even when he's being a tough or a bad guy or a bad influence, it's like there's something good in him, wholesome in him that saves it. You put Steven Seagal or Jean-Claude Van Damme or one of those guys in this movie and it's terrible. It's unwatchable. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But he's just so likable. And again, it's this thing of where he's, you know, and he sustains and so likable and he sustains an enormous amount of cheese. Mm -hmm. Like if, if we, if he was a dish, you could put four times the amount of cheese on that dish and it would still, it would still go down smooth. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's something about him that no matter how cheesy it is, he can still somehow carry it off. And until, and, and like I say, until the end, when it becomes, it really kind of turns into a revenge movie at the yes. end. Yes. Um, it because to itself seriously, yeah. Things have escalated so much to where he uh so the the bad guy blows up the uh so there's red who's this guy that owns a an auto parts place or whatever right. general store that's right next to the bar. He blows up that uh and then he blows up the house of the old farmer guy that uh patrick swayze is renting from and at that point it's like well i can't you know he's not smiling anymore he can't he can't take it anymore and then it just becomes a revenge thing but when we get to the end i love it because so he has you know he like kills or maims or whatever most of the henchmen one guy he doesn't kill him but he pushes a polar bear a stuffed polar bear on top of him that i thought was hilarious but you know, he gets into the big battle with the bad guy at the end and he's he's going to kill him. And then it's like, oh, he stops. And then the bad guy, you know, has his gun that he pulls out and then there's a gunshot and you see and it's one of these guys in the town who he has you know destroyed all their businesses because he's basically like a mob boss where they have to pay a percentage to him or whatever. So just all these guys unload into him with their, their rifles and shotguns. And then the police show up and it's like, anybody see what happened? Nope. I didn't. Did you? Nope. I didn't. So it's just, and then they cut to, uh, you know, back to like, they're having a big party and it's just like, we're just going to let all these guys just murder this. You know, he's a bad guy, but <clears throat> we're just going to let him murder. It's just like, well, I guess nobody saw that, anything. You think this, that's a dangerous president precedent. I don't do you. Nope. Nope. <laughs> so it's just, there's no family or anything to press charges on this guy's behalf or anything like, like that. We're the police. Our job is to show up in uniform. That's it. We just wear the uniform. We don't need to do anything else. And he's been paying off these guys for right. years. You <laughs> know. We're corrupt and, cops anyway. We're, yeah. They were corrupt cops. And I was like, well, I guess we didn't like him anyway, so we're just going to let these guys go. I, I just thought that was just such movie logic, you know, uh, and it's, that's what you want to happen. You know, you don't want it to be right. like a, you know, text right. the, and red and so and so they were all <laughs> went on trial for murder, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, it, you do start to feel like a 14 year old wrote this. You know what I mean? There's a certain point where, like, the basic, you know, the operation of, of a society doesn't make any sense here because some, whoever wrote it doesn't get how communities work. But, you know, you're at that point early on, you're like, oh, this is one you can't think too hard about, or it's just bubblegum logic. But um, would you recommend it? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, it's funny because, because like I say, I've resisted this movie. How many years ago did this come out? 35 years ago or yeah. whatever. Uh, and I've resisted this all this time, but it was, 
it's dumb. I mean, it's a dumb movie. Oh, yes. But it's it, it was much better than I was expecting it. I thought it would be a lot dumber in a, you know. I think it's dumb and offensive, uh, you know, if you want to if you want to watch it that way. But I also found it nostalgic and I found it wildly entertaining. I mean, I think it's so entertaining. Get, you get 15 minutes into this movie and you know what you're in for. And if you're like, oh, I hate this, turn it off. It will not change. It will not improve. It doubles down on itself. But if you watch 15 minutes of it and you can just let the dumb roll over you like water off of a duck's back. This is, a, you know, it's Roadhouse, baby. It's uh, and in no way is it poorly made, you know, I mean, it's everything about it is a, as a professional, you know, a a professional film. And, you know, I've talked about this a million times on the show. So people that, that listen are probably sick of hearing me say this, but I just, you know, I spent all this time talking about how I wasn't really into a lot of these uh, macho action movies at the time, but they're so much better to me than the action movies that we get now, because even though it's implausible and ridiculous and everybody knows Kung Fu and they kick each other in the face and they don't die. uh, It, you know, it's still humans doing things. And that's what I, and that was the other thing. If, if I were in charge of this remake, I would say, let's make it as grounded as we possibly can, not in a Christopher Nolan way, but in a, you know, we're not going to have him fly a plane through the guy's house and, you know, survive or whatever. You know what I mean? I, I, I think this is, you do this as a, uh, I mean, you know, you're going to have to pay Jake Gyllenhaal a lot, but you do this as a, like a $70 million budget. You know, this doesn't need to be, 150 million dollars you know if you can do this for i think the um remember when we did the guest yes the one with um uh i would just have it you know that was an old school action movie in terms of yep there's action but it was the level of action in something like uh roadhouse you don't have to have you know um he doesn't have to be driving around in a tank or something. You know what I mean? I I think you just keep it to physical fights. um, And you don't need a bunch of giant set pieces and things like that in this, you know, I would not do this like the gray man that we watched a couple, you know, a couple of episodes ago. Right. I I think at all, but I, you know, I almost feel like the gray man is an attempt at making a bonkers universe movie like this. And I don't know that you can, I don't know that you can set out to make it and achieve it. Like the room you've seen the room. That's a bonkers universe. And everybody in that movie is trying to do their earnest best. And it's unintentionally hilarious not necessarily because it's so funny, but because it's so weird and simultaneously, inexplicably still watchable. And this one is absolute baloney. It shouldn't be a good movie, but somehow it's really entertaining. In the Ben Gazzara... I think a lot of these... I think a lot of these 80s movies are so fun because it was pre-irony. You know, everything now is right. We know all the jokes and, you know, so everything has to be meta or you're deconstructing. Oh, right. So, you how know, do you make a movie. How do you remake a movie that was that was bonkers pre irony in a post irony world? Like, how do you. You can't remake that. You can't just shoot the same movie and you can't parody it, right? Because just go watch the original one. The original one is... So I guess the question is, why remake Roadhouse? Like, why remake Psycho? They did that too, and it was terrible. Why? Why did Breaking up some. Yeah. Why remake Roadhouse? If I mean, you need to figure out a way to celebrate it. 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's just because it's a name that, you know, that people recognize and people are just like, that was fun, you know. But like you've said, these 80s movies, they were basically kind of doing, um, you know, these were basically kind of just Westerns where things are painted in such broad strokes. I mean, the, the hero is the hero and the bad guy is the bad guy, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's why these, these so many of these old uh, 80s and even kind of into the 90s action movies work so well. Um, and it's, it, it seems like it's really tough to do that now, but, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, like, like we both said, you know, Jake Gyllenhaal is Jake Gyllenhaal doesn't do a lot of bad stuff, you know? No, he, and he, I think he does. I like that he tends towards, not that he hasn't done mainstream things, but he does tend towards the, the weirder, you know what I mean? Like he seems to really seek out the weirder stuff. I thought we we did uh, Enemy mm-hmm. did with uh, Denny Villeneuve, and I thought that was a really interesting film. And uh, Nightcrawler, I think, did he win the Oscar for Nightcrawler? It was a, an amazing performance and a very. I weird... don't think he won. He was nominated, though. Uh, right? But yeah, I think he was nominated. Um, so yeah, it. Uh... And of course, but... Donnie Darko. Yeah, Donnie Darko. I don't know if it's going to be a, uh, I mean, don't, I wouldn't swear to this, but I think it's a Netflix or an Amazon thing. So I don't know. It just seems like so much of that stuff is so mediocre, you know, that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. But yeah, I would definitely, I mean, I imagine, except for younger viewers or younger listeners that most people have seen this i feel like i was one of the like everybody had seen this but me you know in our in our age group or or even somewhat younger but if you if you want to see what action movies were like in the 80s this is a really good example and this i guess wasn't really a hit um until video it was one of those that really it just kind of I think maybe sort of broke even in the theater and became a big hit on home video and became, yeah, I mean, it, like, became kind of a cult classic. Like we said, it kind of sh- changes lanes a couple of times. It, and by the end, it does seem more like a revenge movie. You know, it shifts gears mm-hmm. as you go. Um, anyway, I, I would recommend it. I think it's hugely entertaining. It's um, It's not the most progressive movie out there. But for what it is, there's a reason why people are like Roadhouse is because it's just it's just bonkers. I was laughing and smiling all yeah. through this, you know, <laughs> just for entertainment value. It's it's pretty hard to beat. Um, Chris and Chris talk movies at gmail.com. That's our handle. We are on the YouTube. We are on your podcasts. We're on the Insta. We're in Facebook and things like that. So find us, like us, subscribe. Leave us a message, make a suggestion. We love all that stuff. Uh, for next time, we have talked about two different sword and sorceries ones. We had talked about Dragon Slayer, which you've never seen. Mm. And we talked about Labyrinth, which I'm sure you've seen, but I have. I saw Labyrinth in the movie theater and I have not seen it since then. So I don't think I've seen it since. I could go either way, honestly. I, I'm excited to see both of those. Well, why don't we go with, I mean, uh, Dragon Slayer will always be there. Why don't we, why don't we go? with labyrinth i think it'll be an interesting conversation at the very least yeah they're showing it up here at amherst cinema so i might Uh, be be able to go see it in the theater that would be really cool it may have already screened i need to go see when it's showing but but if if there's an opportunity for me to go actually sit and watch it in the theater that's that'd be fun now did they do a lot of classic stuff and indie things and stuff like that and you know, it's an independent cinema so they like they i went and saw everything everywhere all at once there mm-hmm. and they will show you know an african queen like they somebody's curating and they're doing labyrinth they, cool. some movie lover is or group of movie lovers is is picking and they have they have more fringe mainstream releases as well well, and Labyrinth is one of the, we can get into this more, but La- Labyrinth, uh, when we do the podcast, but Labyrinth is one of those like uh, hot topic um, movies where it, you know, like a generation younger than us uh, has, you know, the, it, it became like uh, they sell kind of like Nightmare Before Christmas is sort of the same thing. 
where they, you know, I don't know if they're still now, but there for a time, it was a big, uh, you know, in hot topic stores in, in malls, they would, you know, sell t-shirts and, and stuff like that. So it, it became, uh, it's become a kind of a cult, uh, thing with, you know, with people who were born way after the movie came out. Right. Jennifer Connelly, right. David uh, and Bowie. Of course, David Bowie. And I think and Hans- it's a Jim Henson did the puppets. Yeah. It's a Jim Henson. Yeah. Film, so, yeah. Um, and I don't remember it very well. I mean, I have kind of uh, iconic images from it mm-hmm. and with the glass sphere and there is, of course, a labyrinth. But uh, yeah, same for me. I don't I don't remember a lot about it. Let's let's I'm... revisit labyrinth for next time. Join. All righty. And um, we can all talk about it together. Sounds great. And unless you have anything else to add, Chris and I will talk to you next week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye.